Welcome to this video on sustainable energy transition. This video is part of a video se series on our successful future in which I try to answer a variety of questions on how humanity can develop sustainably and with well-being into the far future. What are the questions that I want to answer in this video? Well, first of all, what is the current status of the sustainable energy transition? Of course, I should say what I mean by energy, uh, sustainable energy transition. This refers to the change of our energy systems away from fossil resources, which produce CO2, which in turn lead to climate change, towards sustainable energy systems like wind and sun energy. Then how fast do we need to change to reach the climate goals, which are of course associated with the CO2 emissions? What happens if we wait before fostering sustainable energy transition? And finally, can we realistically reach the 1.5 degree centigrade climate goal? These are lots of questions. Of course, in, if I want to answer them, I need a lot of references, a lot of data, and they are mentioned here. On the one hand side, it's the IPCC, Illustrative Model Pathways, which can be downloaded. Then the United Nations Well Population Prospects, which are publicly available for the energy. I'm using the BP statistics, a statistical re review of world energy 2018. For crop production and land area, I'm using the FAUSTAT database, which is also available. And for the CO2 data, I'm using the CDIAC historic historical CO2 data, which are also publicly available. Now, before I look into the details of the analysis, I have to make a very clear statement what I'm doing, what I'm not doing. I don't intend to do a so-called integrated assessment model. What is that? An integrated assessment model is typically a model that is used to generate certain scenarios of future development. So, evaluate possible future developments. And these integrated assessment models use a variety of individual parameters and detailed um, interrelations of variables that may re be relevant. So the population is subdivided into developed, uh, less developed, sometimes even nationally or even regionally resolved. Same holds more or less for all things energy, consumption, industry development, etc. I won't we don't want to do that for a very simple reason, because many of the parameters that are used in, this, uh, in such integrated assessment models uh, can only be estimates. And in the end, we lose a little bit the contact of the accuracy or inaccuracy of such simulations. It's one thing. Secondly, we don't see any more directly the link between the input parameters, so the values that we choose, so to speak, for our development, and then the outcome in the end. And since, as we will be seeing in the later videos, we need to change our behavior, it is quite important that we directly realize how important this behavior is for the final outcome. Otherwise, we won't change behavior. So what I want to do instead is I want to base my considerations on very simple balances, which allows to assess the influence of individual parameters directly, so the influence of the parameters on the final outcome. And we will also be able to realize the main drivers quite easily because we see what is important, what is less important. And that is that view, so to speak, not to look for the detailed models, but rather for the simple but straightforward models is coming actually from my uh, scientific background in the realm of chemical engineering, where there is a publication which shows quite clearly that more complex models are not necessarily better models. They actually show that the simplest model gives already reasonable result and the more complex I get, there's a chance due to inaccuracies of the parameters or not knowing some of the parameters and making some educated guesses that that can go horribly wrong. So I, I don't say anything about that. People are doing lots of effort into that and they will also tell us something, but I want to go for the simpler thing because that way I think that we will clearly be able to see what the major drivers actually are. Now let's look at the system. Why do we want to have this sustainable energy transition? Well, the point is that if we look at the CO2 in parts per million in the atmosphere as a function of time, which can be downloaded from this page, 
we see that the monthly data shown in green and the annual average data have been developing in the past like that. I should say this is a logarithmic scaling, but logarithmic with respect to the pre-industrial values of around 280 ppm. So the scales uh, logarithmically, which means if that is more or less a straight line, the growth is exponential above the pre-industrial value. And we can, of course, extrapolate that and associate cor corresponding climate changes with that. Currently, we are roughly at one degree centigrade climate change. Around 2000, what is that, um, 40, we will be around uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade if we continue as in the past. 2050 will be around 2 degrees centigrade and by um, 2060 we will have reached plus 2.5 degrees centigrade climate change. And we know of course the consequences already observed today with significantly more extreme weather events and we know that that will increase quite significantly. The probability and the intensity of these extreme weather events will increase significantly if we continue as in the past. So if we follow that straight line further into the future. Now one also has to realize something else, which is expressed here. This paper, this diagram is taken from this publication of Jos and co-workers or other authors. And this is, shows actually the result of an emission of uh, carbon dioxide release into the atmosphere, a pulse release of 100 gigatons uh, carbon, which is 300 or so gigatons of CO2, roughly speaking. and um, they investigated, so to speak, corresponding to different systems, models of climate and ocean systems, how that will be developing into the future. I should say this is only a fraction of the CO2 that will be, we will be emitting even if we go for a very fast change in our energy system. And we see actually the fraction of what is released is first of all quickly releasing. This is a time scale, so this is to up to 100 years and then from 100 to 1000 years. And we see that already in roughly 20 years, half of the CO2 will be gone somewhere else. The majority will actually go into the upper ocean layers. There will be an equilibration, so nothing will happen after these 20 years between the upper ocean layers and the air anymore, because that's really an equilibrium. And uh, then after that, we see a slow decrease, which takes almost a millennium to get from this roughly 50% remaining after 20 years to half of that, so 25%. That takes roughly a thousand years. Now, first of all, how can that be explained? Well, the exchange with the upper ocean layers is quite fast. It's a direct contact. But then these upper ocean layers, they have to mix with the lower ocean layers, and that is driven by large streams in the oceans, of which, for example, the Gulf Stream is part. And that has a time scale of 500, 500 years. So on top of this fast exchange with the upper ocean layers, it takes something scaled by these 500 years until that is then driven or transferred into the lower ocean layers. That's one thing. So we understand why that behaves such. On the other hand side, uh, of course, it means that, of course, there's a certain equilibration, which is quickly, and I should directly say I'm accounting for that in all the model calculations I've done, that that occurs. So I mainly actually refer only to the rest remaining after that in the, in the climate models that I'm using. But it also says that after that, the decline in concentration will be quite slow. So after the 20 years and 100 years later, there's hardly any change. This in turn means that if we stop to emit CO2 instantaneously, that CO2 will remain there over an extended period of time. And of course, also the climate change will stay with us for that extended period of time. It will slowly decrease, but only very, very slowly over centuries. That means actually this climate change is not like a fever. You get rid of the disease, so the fossil energy consumption, the CO2 emissions, you get rid of that and then it's gone. No, it's not such. We stop energy, uh, fossil energy consumption or uh, also uh, the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere and then the climate change will stay, uh, stay with us for centuries essentially and very slowly only decline. 
Now in order to investigate a little bit our influence on that and what we can do about that, I should mention that I'm always looking at global balances. I'm, this is my system that I'm looking at, the overall Earth. And in order to get now a very first idea of how we, so to speak, use the resources, I want to show the energy consumption that we have. It's in kilowatt hours per capita. And here per capita means I simply take the overall value divided by the number of people. Here I do it country by country, but in principle I can also do the same, of course, globally by dividing by the world population and then I get the value per person or per capita. This is now the primary energy consumption in kilowatt hours per capita in year for different countries plotted versus their world population and the countries are sorted with respect to their per capita consumption. Well, of course, this is a very interesting uh, representation because vertically we have the per capita consumption and horizontally we have the number of people in the corresponding country. If you multiply that, that's the overall consumption in the country, which means, of course, the area of this rectangle directly corresponds to the overall consumption in that country. There are two countries that are so big that you can directly see them, India, China and the United States. They have significant global contributions. On the other hand side, we see that the global average is somewhere here on the green line. Developed countries are a little bit higher, a little bit less than 50,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year and the global average is around 21,000 kilowatt hours per year. European countries some are somewhere over here. Typically, their values during the last years have been slowly declining. Germany is somewhere here. Belgium, where I'm located, is somewhere here. So, a very relatively high uh, energy consumption per capita in Belgium. And we see, of course, that these are, or we can guess, that these are the less developed countries. So, if they want to develop, they will increase their per capita energy consumption. At the same time, we see that the more developed countries, they have to decrease their consumption so that in the end we will hopefully wind up somewhere between these two values. And that's also what I want to use in my scenarios that I regard, that we wind up somewhere here. And we will see that in the next slide actually somewhere around 30,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year by the end of the century. And this is actually shown here. So these are now again the data for the averages, how they develop now over time, the global average the non-OECD countries contributing 6.1 billion people, the OECD countries contributing 1.3 billion people. And uh, this is my overall projection that I use into the future, as I said, almost 30,000 kilowatt hours per capita and here by the end of the century. And that is taking into account that less developed countries are developing, increasing in their per capita energy consumption and that the developed countries need to significantly reduce their per capita energy consumption so that in the end there will be some convergence and the average value, I assume, that that follows this protection. From the population development, which is worked out in the corresponding video on world population, together with this per capita consumption, now the overall primary energy consumption can be described or developed. These are the past data and we see that with the high population variant, the medium population variant and the low population variant, where these population variants are those of the most recent world population prospect of the United Nations, uh, follows. Typically, people use the medium variant, but as I argue in that video on world population, we should take the high var variant into account as well. So I will take these two variants into account in my further uh, studies. Now, of course, if you want to replace this uh, mostly fossil primary energy that we use by renewable energy technologies, we have to look how fast can those grow. Because we have to grow them, we have to increase their contribution, how fast did they grow in the past. And that is shown in this diagram. This shows the growth rate in percent per year, so how many percent has the corresponding technology increased in one year as a function of time. And I always combine solar and wind because individually they have quite strong fluctuations because at times solar was more popular, at other times wind. So I take the average, uh, I take the sum because that gives a better, more stable overall value. And there we see that we reached almost 35% back shortly before 2000. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, we were roughly at a level of say 25% and then it decreased down to 20% roughly at the moment. 
Hydrogen energy, of course, has also been increasing by a small percentage. It's, of course, a very a relatively larger contribution overall than solar and wind today. But we see that the growth rate is quite low. And if you study the literature, you realize that the overall capacity has a maximum limit. So hydrogen energy cannot be the solution for sustainable energy technologies. Nevertheless, I, in my models, assume a certain increase, low level up to a maximum level um, that was estimated. So the major contribution of our shift, our transition in our energy system away from fossil resources to sustainable energies has to come from solar and wind. I also account, I should say that, for those interested about geothermal, I treat it similar to hydro energy, a growth rate, but a maximum limit that can be reached. Nevertheless, solar and wind can have the maximum contribution. Now the question is, how fast can that grow? And in order to characterize, I'm using I'm explaining this with this diagram. This is the so-called substitution rate in percent per year versus time. Now, what do I mean by substitution rate? Substitution rate is that fraction of the primary energy consumption that is substituted with the corresponding energies, with solar and wind energy in that case, per year. So, in one year, I'm building up additional wind and solar capacities and they replace fossil primary energy carriers and what is the percentage that is replaced in that one year. And that is plotted here for wind and solar. It's a logarithmic scale so that this is almost linear means we have an almost exponential increase. And with the different growth rates that have been shown in the previous diagrams, we can have 20, 25 or 30 percent growth rates. And that means as a substitution rate would follow these lines. So this means a growth rate. So from year to year an increase in 20%, which then substitutes corresponding values of the primary energy consumption as shown on this diagram. And this is 20% growth rate, which is the current value, 30% one that we reached already in the past sometime, but which would mean compared to today that we increase our effort for our sustainable energy transition by a factor of 1.5. So this means significantly more effort to be put into this energy transition. And 20% means that we maintain the level we have at the moment and don't continue de to decrease that as we have observed during the last uh, couple of years. Now, of course, this increase cannot be going on forever because this would mean exponential increase. That cannot be. And for example, if we reach here the 10%, that would mean that in that year we replace 10% of our primary energy systems by sustainable energies. And apparently that's a very large number and we will not reach that presumably. So there have to be some estimates of the maximum substitution rate that is possible and then we have to limit it to that. Now how can we estimate that? For that we can have a look at different, um, well, actually in the end money that we put into our energy system. On the one hand side we realize that the total primary energy consumption is increasing roughly 22% at least on the average over the last 20 years. Which means we are taking money and building up 2% additional primary energy consumption or energy technologies every year. On the other hand side we are also maintaining, repairing uh, our existing uh, power plants and for that, in order to characterize that, one can use a so-called economic lifetime of a power plant and depending on the power plant, that economic lifetime is somewhere between 25 and 40 years, which means that you replace, so to, I should first say what economic lifetime means, that means that you take certain money for repairs, for renovations, uh, exchange of certain installations or even building new power plants and the uh, time until you invest more or less the cost of one power plant into that to maintain it, to keep it in operation, that's of the order of 25 to 40 years. And that means in turn that you invest the price for a new power plant in that time, which means you are averaging over all the economies more or less that you annually put in 2.5 to 4 percent new power plants or money corresponding to 2.5 to 4 percent new power plants, which is expressed here, this 2.5 to 4 percent. And of course, if you would take that money and put it into sustainable energy technologies instead, 
that would then lead, of course, to a corresponding growth, assuming that the costs for both for fossil energy systems as well as a sustainable energy system that is, that is comparable, but there are studies actually that, that, that show that they are quite similar. Of course, the cost structure is different for fossil power plant. The power plant will be a little bit cheaper, but you continually have to buy your energy carriers, coal and gas, for example, while for the sustainable energy technologies, the wind turbines and photovoltaics, the investment is higher, but you don't have to pay for wind or sun. And so the cost structure is different, but studies show that the overall price for energy will be quite similar. And that means, of course, that we can assume, more or less, that the growth rates like that can be, or substitution rates like that can be achieved somewhere of the order of between 2 and, say, 3% or so. That's what I'm assuming. Why only 3%? Why not the 2% and possibly on top of this, uh, the increase, increase in total primary energy? Well, there's a reason for that. And I want to show it and explain it in this diagram. This shows for some country, exemplarily chosen, the final energy that we use. So how is it is used by the consumer? Crude oil, for example, for room heating, coal, natural gas, also for room heating, crude oil, of course, also for transport electricity, renewables, mostly for heating or community heating. And from that we have transport, illumination, electric data process, electronic data processing, steam generation and so on and the heating at the end. That's the current system. So this is the effective energy that we use in the end. And this is the final energy as it is used in the last piece of equipment that converts it into something useful for us. So transport or heating or whatever. And that has to change and it has to change for example like this that we, with the solar panels and with the wind turbines, we produce mostly electricity or hydrogen that is electrically produced by electrolysis, or we have biofuels or biogas that we use. So, and of course, this has completely been changed now. We will possibly use the same, so this is the same as here, so we will have the same use for the energy, but it has to relate now to these energy carriers that we have here. That means that actually the end user has to change his or her appliances. So for room heating we won't use any oil heating device or gas heating devices anymore, gas ovens. We will have to use electricity instead or possibly hydrogen. We don't know how that will work out but possibly electricity with heat pumps. That's one way to realize that. And of course that means that we do not only have to exchange the power plant, so to speak, instead, so instead of fossil power plants, build photovoltaics and wind turbines, also the end consumer has to change his or her final appliances, the ovens, the cars, it will be electrical cars and all those things. So there is an additional effort and typically these pieces of equipment are slightly more expensive or we have to buy them earlier than we would, we would otherwise do that in order to support this energy transition and that, that creates extra cost and that actually slows down the overall process. And that's why I believe that somewhere around 3% may be a maximum. You can have a different opinion, you would see the outcome directly if you look at the diagrams. So the three scenarios that I want to use are actually this. It's between 20% and 30% growth rate, starting from the historical value, so to speak, and reaching limits between 2 and 3% substitution rate, maximum substitution rate per year. So the 3% was argued before, 2% is a sort of easier scenario. And I should say this highest scenario, 30% annual growth rate, means increasing our efforts by one point, by a factor of 1.5 and the 3% really pushing limits to the upper limit that I believe is globally feasible. And uh, so that is more or less already not our standard way. That needs, means we have to put significant political effort and also budget into that. And uh, possibly this 20% and 2% is more realistic from the current point of view. And now we can see how these three scenarios, how they influence our energy consumption in the future, how that will change things. This is again the primary energy consumption. I should say I've been using um, the primary energies based on current conversion rates. So I'm always 
actually during f final energy consumptions, but then relate that to today with the corresponding efficiencies. This is the primary energy uh, in, of the renewables here in this case, renewables to the three scenarios. So the three renewable scenarios, which is the easiest in red and the most challenging in green. So this is a 20% growth rate to 2% uh, maximum substitution rate, and this is the 30% growth rate and 3% uh, uh, substitution rate at maximum together with the high population variant, where this total demand is exponentially, more or less exponentially increasing. And we see that the renewables will eventually grow and hit the total demand. And then, of course, we don't, at that point, we don't need any fossil energy carriers anymore. So these are three scenarios. Of course, they are very simplistic, especially at the end. The question is, does that really stop like that? Or is there some delay time with that? That's something one has to work out, of course, in more detail, but this gives the main idea, so to speak, the main trends that are relevant. At the same time, one can now see how much CO2 we are producing, how much CO2 we are emitting into the atmosphere, which is then used to estimate the climate change associated with the different scenarios. And we see that with the most challenging scenario, we will reach at the end, so around 2050, a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And with the least challenging, so the easiest scenario, we will reach almost 2 degrees centigrade. And of course, this span, so to speak, this range corresponds to those climate changes that are mentioned in the COP21 Paris Agreement of 2015, where we stated or there's agreement between corresponding countries that we would like to, or that we have to limit the climate change to two degrees and we should put all effort into reaching even only 1.5 degrees. So that range is uh, covered here. So it can be managed with these scenarios where I would say that the 1.5 degrees is so challenging seen from today that it's not likely that if we continue at the speed and the efforts that we have today that we will actually be reaching that. So I think that actually from that diagram one can see we have to push the limit so strongly actually as compared to today our efforts so strongly that I believe that with current political efforts we will not be able to reach that scenario. Now we can also see other things from this uh, diagram. We see that the maximum of CO2 production, which of course corresponds to the maximum consumption of fossil resources, is somewhere depending on the scenario between in two to five years. Around that time, there's a maximum we run through, which means after that, the consumption of fossil resources will decline, which means that the prices, of course, since it's a question of supply and demand, the prices may decrease. If the prices decrease, the most expensive technologies, of course, won't be economical anymore, which means, for example, in some places, the so-called fracking is relatively expensive, that that won't be pursued anymore. So the corresponding extraction sites will close down, which means then also the supply side will uh, decrease, or so less supply, which means that there's an increase of the price again. So we can directly see from that that Around that time here, in two to five years, we have to expect that the oil prices, or fossil energy prices in general, will show very strong fluctuations. The so so-called volatility will increase. At the same time, somewhere around here, so in some 10 to 20 years, we are falling with the overall consumption of fossil resources significantly below today's values, which in turn means that also the so-called downstream processes will have difficulties. The refineries will have to produce less than, say, 80% of their maximum cap capacity. And I talked to some refinery operators and they told me in the economic crisis in 2008-2009, they were happy that the consumption was not decreasing below 80% because below 80% they can only shut down the equipment. Their variability with respect to their operating parameters limits the operation somewhere between design point and 80% below that, below 80%, below it doesn't work anymore. So you can't adjust the processes such that that will lead to a significant proper, proper output of the plant. So here we have also then dying refineries, which again has, of course, significant economic implications. Of course, certain countries will subsidize their energy systems, their energy uh, industries, because they live on that 
to a certain degree, which again then means it means only that, com uh, that countries are investing in a dying economy, which is possibly not the best, uh, which means that the economic stability of countries may be uh, decreasing significantly. So here we, I, I don't want to say that any of things, these things will directly happen. It only means that in this range of time, somewhere between in say three years to 20 years, there will be a high risk of economy really doing funny things. So it will be risky and we have to see that we pass through these times more or less safely. We can manage that of course, but we have to really be careful to pass through these times quite safely. At the same time, of course, large energy sectors need to be changed. Automotive in, uh, industry, chemical plants, they won't use fossil resources as well anymore, but rely on biomass, for example, or CO2 from the atmosphere that has to be built up. The heating systems in the houses have to be changed. The um, power plants will change. We'll, we'll have photovoltaics and, photovoltaics and wind instead. So all that has to be changed. Large fractions of our major industries will change completely adding to the risk that can occur in that uh, time span somewhere over here. Now, I didn't mention that this was always for the, or I mentioned that only briefly at the beginning, this was all for the high population variant. One can do the same scenarios for the medium population variant. Then things actually will work out a little bit earlier. So it doesn't take until 2075, but only a little less than 2070 here. Also the climate goals that we reach shift a little bit better, so we will, uh, it won't be 1.9 something, but instead 1.76 degrees centigrade that we reach with this easiest scenario and even a little bit below the 1.5 degrees for the most challenging scenario. If we collect all this data, we see that for the three scenarios that I have mentioned, for the medium and the high population variant, we reach temperatures that are in the range of the, that are currently discussed as climate goals. And we see that the end of the transition of this sustainable energy transition also is somewhere in the range between 2050 and 2075. That's what you also find in the literature, which in turn means that the scenario calculations that I do are not too wrong. They show the main trend correctly. And that's quite important because this allows us to say, well, if we learn something from that, that has something really to do with reality. I should also say that I didn't account for these so-called negative emission technologies, which is the carbon dioxide removal very generally expressed from the atmosphere. So you take this CO2 from the atmosphere, collect it and then dump it away, either directly sequestering or storing it somewhere underground in suitable um, geological formation, so the carbon capture and storage. You can also combine that with bioenergy, so first using uh, planting um, or using energy crops, burning them or the major energy carrier generated from that and then collect on that side the uh, carbon dioxide produced by the, by the burning of the biomass and then store that or you can directly remove the uh, carbon dioxide from the air, this is this ducts, or you can catch some of the CO2 additionally by afforestation or reforestation, which is one aspect of this agricultural forestry and other land uses, a FOLU, uh, that is also mentioned in the corresponding literature if you'll have a look at that. This is not included because this is only a business case if the trading with the CO2 emissions will continue until that time. It's not foreseeable if that really is worked out. Until now this is only locally realized, not yet globally. So. If the economic systems are getting under pressure, the question is if that will really be maintained or if people don't rather try to sell their stuff as cheap as possible and then you can't pay for CO2 extra, that doesn't make sense. Also, conceptually, it's a debt for the future and also it's a bet for future political and technological development. We don't know how technology will develop because many of these uh, uh, technologies are, of course, possible in principle but we do not yet know if they will become economically feasible. And also politics, as I mentioned previously before several times, that has an influence how that evolves. Even the IPCC in the recent special report on the 1.5 degree centigrade climate change mentioned that these technologies that, that this or this negative emission technology is subject to multiple feasibility and sustainability constraints. 
So there are significant constraints where we simply don't know how that develops. So I did not include that. If we should manage these things, things can only get better. For the moment, I did not include that. Okay. And actually one should say these things will only become relevant more or less at the very end. Possibly we can then extract CO2 from the atmosphere additionally, but for this major energy change it's not foreseeable that these things will have really a significant contribution. Now one question I also wanted to answer, I think most of the questions that I posed in the beginning of this video are answered meanwhile. One thing that is still open is the question, what happens if we delay our increased effort for this sustainable energy transition? And I want to explain in this diagram how I evaluated that. This diagram is split into two. On the one hand side, to the left side, the energy scenarios are characterized. So what is really the effort put into this energy transition? And to the right, we then see what would be required to reach the climate goals. Now, the energy transitions are characterized here on the one hand side with the growth rate, as before, as well as with this maximum substitution rate and the three scenarios are plotted here. So the 2% uh, maximum substitution rate and 20% growth rate of wind and solar is this point. The 2.5-25 uh, is this and the most challenging, the 3% uh, maximum growth rate and 30, uh, no, 30% growth rate and 3% maximum substitution rate is this point. So I plotted a line through that and I assume that before we start to intensify our efforts, we start out at this point. Only 10% growth rate and maximum substitution rate of 1%. That's easy, so to speak. We will definitely be able, or we should definitely be able to manage that. And then I assume on the other hand side that the growth rate beyond 30% is not really manageable. We uh, saw that, didn't see that in recent years in reality. So I limit that here, but the maximum substitution rate, I assume that that can increase arbitrarily. I could have chosen other dependencies, but that's how I did it, so to speak. Other things wouldn't lead to significantly, fundamentally different results, so it, I think we, we can stick with that for the discussion. And now, depending on the high population variant, I ask the question, if I stay at this low uh, increase of efficiency, so this growth rate of 10%, and then at some later time switch to um, a higher uh, effort to manage the sustainable energy transition, where do I need to switch in order to be able to still reach the climate goal? So just as an example, if I stay at this low growth rate of 10% un until say 225, then decide to switch and I'm following the high population variant, then I increase my efforts and I realize that I have to go be above 4% maximum substitution rate at that year, so to speak, at, at that year in 2025, to still be able to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade. So we see if we plot that for the high population variant and for the medium population variant, that we gain some time if we follow the medium population variant, but that time is not so much if we want to go for the 1.5 degree centigrade goal, because actually that has to be reached so soon that the difference between the population variants is not getting so big that that is of a really significant influence. It has a certain influence, it's there, yes, it can be realized, but it will not be dramatic. If we include the in this diagram also the 2 degree centigrade, that this scale has a little bit extended, uh, been extended, then we see that for the plus 2 degree centigrade, the difference between the medium and the high population variant is significantly larger. Also, we see that there is a certain difference between the 1.5 degree centigrade goal and the 2 degree centigrade goal, something of the order of 20-25 years. And that implies now that if we wait another 20 years at this low uh, point that I indicated before, then actually we are in the same situation as we are today for the 1.5 degree centigrade goal, where we realize that that is actually hard to manage. It's, it's really hard to manage to reach that goal. So if we wait 20 years, then we will, it will be equally hard to reach that goal. And actually the problem is the behavior of the system can be shown here. The effort is first of all increasing very slowly, so it's getting a little bit more difficult every year. But then it increases quite dramatically and it's more than exponential, it's a hyperbolic increase for those who know a little bit of math, and that is faster than exponential. 
which is of course horrible because there is a certain limit beyond which you, won't, you will simply not be able to reach that goal anymore. And this behavior is of course politically quite bad because it appears that we can manage, we can manage, we can manage and then oh, we can't manage anymore. So the transition from that we will be able to manage to where we are not able anymore, that's a very short time period. So and typically actually only in that range we realize that we should be doing something and then actually it's already almost too late. And that's the big problem of such system responses and in this case especially this climate change uh, issue. So actually we see on the other hand side if we start out with as much effort as is possible today, then actually the effort that we need is quite low to reach that climate goal, which means in turn we should start today and we should foster the sustainable energy transition as much as possible because that way it will stay relatively easy to reach that. The longer the wait we wait, the worse it will get, will get and it will get significantly worse quite quickly towards the end of this uh, perspective. Of course, there are the other climate goals in between 1.6 and so on, 1.7 and wherever you will wind up, so to speak, that is de determined by the efforts that you put into the system, as we have seen before, actually. So I've also discussed that bad behavior of the system. Now we can conclude. On the one hand side, the turning point for the energy for the consumption of fossil resources will occur somewhere in two to ten years. The strong effect will occur somewhere in five to twenty years, which means that in that time span, somewhere the volatility of the prices of the fossil feedstock will significantly increase. So the variability. I believe that we overslept the 1.5 degree climate goal. At least if we don't put significant um, effort into that directly and in a very consolidated way global, globally, but I don't foresee that. If you look at the current treaties that have been signed by countries, it's not foreseeable that that will be reached. If, even if you want to reach the 2.0 degree centigrade, an urgent and concerted action would be required on global scale. Um, and it's not only building up more solar and wind power plants, but rather we also need to change the end-use technologies, electrical cars, electrical heating systems and so on. And of course uh, that means that we need a complete and quick restructuring of the major industries which is required if you want to manage that in this relatively short time span, if you want to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade, it's just another 30 years at most. And if you take into account that building up some new plant, some bigger technology that takes at least something of the order of 10 years, then you realize that the time is not so arbitrarily long. And of course, we also realize that reducing the population growth simplifies transition, especially for the 2 degrees centigrade goal. That is quite a significant change. 1.5 degrees, it's also a simplification, but not as strong. And of course, I didn't mention that here, but bioenergy and biomaterials use could help with reaching these uh, climate goals in the end. So we need to go for these things, at least uh, try to foster them, because actually when the um, energy system has changed, we won't use any fossil resources anymore, then also biomaterials have to think, well, what are they doing? And that will actually part, be part of the videos also in some uh, later videos where we'll be discussing the options that we have for that. With that, I would like to close this video and I hope to see you again in the other videos of this series.